Lord God, speak to us, encourage us, heal us, challenge us, and more than anything, help us know how very much you love us. Amen. It's a special treat this morning, post Matilda's, because instead of a three-point sermon, I thought we should have a five-point sermon. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's what I reckon. Yes. Yes, it's fantastic. Five whole points, and then even maybe some more, and that excludes the introduction and the conclusion. Brace yourselves. Not really. Here's a recap from last week, in case you weren't here. Uh, this doesn't count as a point, by the way, just to be clear. Uh, last week, we, we talked about this graph that, on which you can map human existence. If you recall, we said, over, this is how life works, right? You're born, you have very little glory. As you grow, you accumulate more glory, and then you decline, right? And, yeah, so. And the goal of life, every human being's goal, basically is to maximize your glory. Maybe next Sunday afternoon, or whenever the Matildas play, if they get through the finals, that'll be a lot of glory. But even them, it's just really downhill, even for them. And for all of us, this is how life works, right? And you're born, uh, some people die very soon, and that's tragic. And others of us, as technology helps us, the shape of the graph might be this. That's the ideal, isn't it, in our culture? You live a wonderful, happy, productive life, and then you die very quickly, painlessly, in your sleep, surrounded by family and loved ones. And we said, that's the basic arc of human existence. I said, and that's a bit bleak and depressing, because there's a better story we looked at last week, and the better story is the story of Jesus, and the story of Jesus is different, because this is Jesus. He starts up here in glory, off the page, he gives away his glory. He dies here at the peak when everyone else is reaching their greatest glory in their early 30s. That's when Jesus actually dies. But the great news is he doesn't stay dead. He, in fact, gets raised from the dead and goes on to live forever in an eternity of glory that stretches out for all time. And the promise of Christianity is what? that you and I can, you and I have a choice to make, and we can align ourselves with this story, or we can align ourselves with that story. You can trust Jesus and then join him on this journey, or you can continue to live your own life, which could be wonderful, and it's great on the way up, it sucks on the way down. Uh, but you could do that, and that's the choice each of us make, and that's where we are. Now, all got that? You go, yes, that's cool. Here's the problem, or a problem, or many of our problems between, say I'm, I don't know, say I'm here, and final glory here, I don't know how you even put it, between here and here, in this gap, between when I start to become a follower of Jesus and when I finally go to be with him, that gap, that time, can be full of enormous challenges to our faith. It can be hard, right? And that was the point of the question we were discussing. What makes it hard to be a follower of Jesus? Now, what I love about the Apostle Paul, what I love about Romans 8, what I love about the Bible, is it's brutally realistic about life. It's psychologically incredibly insightful and honest about the human experience and the experience of faith. After Paul does this amazing presentation of the glory that is to come and that the glory that will be ours makes our present troubles seem inconsequential, Right, oh, it's, look at this, man. When you, when you've been up here for a billion years, who's going to worry about a bit of sadness down here? When you've been in a new body and the new creation for a billion years, who's going to care about arthritis and insomnia and depression and cancer? They just 
Uh, it might have been your lot in life for 20, 30, 40, 60, 70 years, but in a billion years, you're not even going to worry about that. And you go, that's amazing, Paul. I'm on the mountaintop. I'm looking down. And then Paul immediately goes, yeah. what then shall we say in response to these things? There's this great mountaintop. We're going to be glorified. This is where we're heading, folks. He will glorify us. He's predestined, called, justified, and glorified. It's done and dusted. But then there's challenges along the way, and he enumerates them. And the challenges come in, there are five deep, profound challenges that approach that we will, that every human person of faith, anyone who claims to follow Jesus, is going to experience. Here's the first challenge, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What's the big challenge here? Trusting in God? Yeah, but what's going to make that hard to trust in God? You're going to face challenges? Yes. What specifically is the challenge? Devil or ourselves? Okay, think about this. Who can be against us? Think about this. What's he really saying? The challenge, the first challenge is opposition from people. The assumption behind this statement is that there are a lot of people who are going to be against you. And that's real. That's real. When I became a follower of Jesus, my father's favorite description of me was a born-again mother. That was how dad used to talk about my faith. My, my Jewish mum was just in tears when I told her of my encounter with God. She just was like, I failed. And she, she raised me as a Catholic to appease my father, whose last time he went to church was when they got married. But she'd made this promise to the priest because she wanted to get to do what was right. So then she's in tears because she goes, I failed as a Jew because you're not Jewish. I failed as a Catholic because you're not Catholic. I'm just a failure. Opposition, like outright hostility from my dad, passive aggressive tears from my mum. And that was nothing in the broad scheme of opposition that people experience for their faith. We experience sticks and stones, words. No one dragged me out of my house and stoned me. No one's kidnapped my daughter and taken her off into sex slavery because she's a Christian girl, because happening in Nigeria. No one has discriminated against me, excluded me from education, from university, from employment because of my faith. It's happening in India, all parts of the Middle East, all over the world. Yeah. And then you go back to when Paul was writing this, no one's falsely imprisoning me. No one's torturing me to death, putting me in the Colosseum against animals to kill me. My life, there's a bit of opposition for sure, for me. And, uh, and it's real, but gosh, through the course of 2,000 years, this has been real. So, so real for so many people, and it is still today. More Christians today lose their faith, lose their lives because of their faith in any other religious group. And, and really, we are the most persecuted religious group in the world, and you'd never know it from just listening to the media who make out that in our culture, Christianity is associated with Western civilization, colonialism, patriarchy, and power, and you can't possibly conceive of the idea that a Christian might be a victim and therefore, but it's true around the world, our sisters and brothers in Jesus face enormous opposition. So you go, that's, that's not my problem. True. Your problem may be more subtle and it may increase. The opposition you may face is the, the subtle opposition of being silenced. You know, if you speak out, you'll be canceled. You know, you've got to watch what you say. And that's hard. And that's a cost. And the opposition, the pressure to, to just be quiet, just dial it down, just backtrack a little, just assimilate, adopt the small target strategy. 
And Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Huh. If a billion Muslim people want to persecute me because of my faith, they're still in the minority. <laughs> and they're the weak ones because God, the creator of the universe, is for me. I remember being taught this when I was at university, which was a fairly hostile environment even back when I went there. It's, someone once said to me, any one person with God is a distinct majority in any situation. It's like, yeah, man. If God is for me, it doesn't matter. God is for me. God is for you. In Christ, he's for you. I can't. So yeah, it can be hard, and maybe it's going to get harder for you. And maybe it's going to get harder for me, and maybe you're going to struggle with misunderstanding. Maybe one day, even here in Australia, we'll, we'll encounter direct persecution for the things we believe. But, but God's for us, so it doesn't matter. It's okay, it's real, but God is for us. Okay, first challenge. It's hard, but God's for us. That's the answer. Opposition from people. Okay, how about this? Here's a challenge. Can you unpack, understand that? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? What is the challenge to our faith that the Apostle Paul is answering buried in this verse? Suffering, yes, and lack. Okay, a few more words. That's a great word, lack. The challenge is, who's behind the lack? So, so here's a challenge. This is the lack. Exactly. That's the result. The result is lack, but the real challenge to my faith is I look at my lack and I think, God, you haven't come through for me because you don't love me or you're not able to. You're a withholding parent. That seems to be the question, the challenge that Paul is answering. And isn't that so real? This is the irony. It's not an irony. This is the reality of how we have evolved as human beings. That, that absence of provision, lack, negative things have a disproportionate impact on us than the provision of things because I'm wired up to pay acute attention to my hunger and my thirst so I can be motivated to go out and get food and drink. Now, that means in all of life, we're wired up to pay great attention to the things we don't have and take for granted the things we have. And even now, when we live in a world of super abundance, we're still wired up like that and we can still focus and be consumed with all the ways in which God has not provided and God has let us down. And there can be many of those. I don't know. And there's a peculiar challenge here as well. I don't know if you've experienced this, where you look perhaps at people who have no faith or little faith, and maybe even the people who oppose you, and it seems that their lives are so much better than yours. They're richer, they're happier, they're healthier. And you go, why hasn't God provided for me? You, you prayed for healing and he didn't heal you. You prayed for a good job and you, you got sacked. You, you, you asked God for a loving partner and your marriage ended. You prayed for your kids and they still ended up broken and damaged. And, and you go, God, why haven't you provided? And so this is the answer. The answer is, 
remember that God has done the, the hardest thing of all. He's, he's provided his own son, Jesus Christ. How then is he not going to actually give us everything we really need? And if he hasn't given you everything you feel like you really need, there's two answers. One is your perception of what you really need is not right. Or two, it hasn't come through, God hasn't come through yet. It's either your perception's wrong or the timing isn't quite right. So this is the hope. He says, yes, it looks like there's a lot of lack, but listen, if God could crucify his own son, then meeting your needs for intimacy and connection and healing and hope, God can totally, absolutely do that. And he will do that. Getting you from here to glory is a piece of cake for God because he's done something infinitely harder than that. And of course, that makes so much sense for those of us who, if you love someone, if you have a kid, the thought of giving up your kid, nothing could be harder, I don't think, than that would be unthinkably, unimaginably hard. And God's done that. He's not going to hold out on you. God's not a withholding parent. He has nothing but good in store. And that's shown to us by the cross. That's the second one. Third. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? What do you think the challenge to our faith is here? What's the underlying issue that Paul is grappling with? Persecution? Societal rejection? Yes. Who are the charge that Christians have it easy? I'll tell you what I think's going on here, and, and, and tell me if, if you think this is right. And think in the law court, think in our legal system, when you get charged, what is the assumption? That you're guilty, that you've done something wrong, okay? That you've done something wrong. So I think the major, the major problem here is I stuff up and I get charged because I've done something wrong. Okay, I don't know. Does that make sense? Who's going to bring a charge? So you, so this is the common complaint about Christians. They're not very Christian, are they? They're all hypocrites. Christians claim to love people, but look how they fail in love. And then, if you're honest, you look in the mirror and you might say to yourself, yeah, man, they're right. The charge against me that I fail to love you, is that true or false? Man, it's a true charge. It's, you put me in court and mount, and if you looked at the evidence for my failures at many levels to live in the way of Jesus, you'd have no trouble proving that, right? Guilty as charged, Your Honor. That's a problem. Actually, not so much in our culture, because we all have drunk from the well that says, we're all intrinsically good and wonderful and snowflakes and perfect and lovely. But actually, we know, like when you strip away all that garbage, I know. Okay. And so the answer is, yeah, okay, you've been charged, you're guilty, but it is God who justifies. Now, what does the word justify mean? It means to declare to be in the right. It's God as the judge who goes, okay, Mark, all the evidence says you fail to love, and at one level you have, but bang, I'll, I'll hit down my gavel and I'll say, Mark, you're innocent. Why? Because Christ has stood in your place. This is all the argument of the first eight chapters of Romans. So it's God who justifies me. I don't have to. Even when I'm guilty, even when the charge stands, God declares me to be acceptable, to be innocent, to be forgiven. I walk out of court a free person. Okay? So my own stuff up. Who then is the one who condemns? Okay, so this is a, what's the challenge here? Condemnation. And that's a little different from a legal charge. Who condemns us? Who condemns us? Now, I want to suggest that there are 
in most of us have a script or a tape on a loop. We have a, an audio loop in our heads of condemnation. And on that audio loop, there are going to be a couple of voices. One might be your mum's voice going, you're never good enough. You're never enough. One might be your dad's voice going, you're such a disappointment. You're never going to amount to much. You always let me down. It's always your fault. Criticism, judgment, condemnation from our family of origin. Those are vo powerful voices. Powerful voices that live inside our heads to condemn us. Right? But there's another voice, isn't there? What's often the most, the loudest voice of condemnation comes from who? Yourself. Oh, Mark, why did you do that again? Yes, not you, Mark, me, Mark. Yeah, I'm talking about myself. So just clarifying. <laughs> why did you, why are you such a failure? Oh, man. And, and you know, the beautiful thing in my job is I have lots of people who over 30 years have been quite happy to give that internal voice of self-condemnation ammunition because I'm so flawed. And if you're newish to the church and you think I'm not, just give it time. And so you can go, oh, 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 oh. I'm such a mess. How, how can God love me when I'm like that? Like self-condemnation is such a powerful force in our lives and it erodes our faith. It makes it so hard to trust that God would love us and accept us and that we're enough. The word of internalized self-condemnation that is relied upon in our culture to sell us innumerable goods and services is the, the, the self-condemnation that says you're never enough, you're never enough, you're never enough. You're never skinny enough. You're never smart enough. You're never secure enough. You're never safe enough. You're never popular enough. You're never healthy enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. Just, ah. Oh. And so what does Paul say? Who then is the one who condemns? He says, no one. Let no one condemn you. No one should condemn you because Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So when any voice comes and says, Mark, you're not enough, guess what? Jesus Christ, who died for you, who died for me, is standing next to God going, Mark's enough. He's enough. I died for him. He's enough. He's enough. There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is how Paul started this wonderful chapter of Romans. No condemnation. And he's there reminding the Father, standing there saying, I did it all for you. No one can condemn you. Don't listen to it. Now, you know why those, why that force of condom, those words of condemnation have such power in our lives? Because they're animated by a spiritual energy that comes from Satan, the great condemner of God's people. Satan is going to take our own propensities and that of others, and he's going to add a spiritual force that condemns you, says, oh, you're not enough for God. You're not good enough. You're not religious enough. You're not moral enough. Come on. Come on, Mark. You're such a failure. Who are you? You're an Anglican minister. You're professionally religious. You tell other people how to live. And Satan takes all these words and goes, yeah, you're not enough. And against that, Paul says, no, Jesus Christ is standing there going, Mark, you're enough. No one can condemn you. Just delete those audio tracks from your mind, turn down the volume on them and turn up the volume of Jesus speaking words of complete affirmation and acceptance over you. And then what is, this was, sorry, that was four in case you want to know. Condemnation. Yeah, we are. Yeah, you were told that every our society tells us, in fact, everything is okay, we're all fine, and we don't live in a culture where we struggle with condemnation. And hang on, 
you th Liz, uh, you, we're constantly told that. Just, and we don't believe it when we're told we're all okay. Depressed, angry, fed up, miserable, constantly struggling. You need this, you need to do that. Yeah. It comes in a different way. I think the con, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think what, and thank you, because I, let's remake that. Let's recycle around that. The, it's not a religious condemnation or an overtly moral one, but it's, it comes more in the sense of a failure to, to flourish and self-actualize and, and that never enoughness. I don't know. Does anyone, you resonate when I speak about you're never enough, I can see everyone you're in gay. Like you go, man, we are never enough. Yeah, you can't, because because you all and actually when I think about um, young, one of the reasons behind the anxiety and the depression and the lostness of young people is they're told a message all the time: "You're wonderful, you're great." Like the whole self-esteem nonsense, like the way you've got to build resilient kids by pumping them up and saying you're fantastic. But they know that's a lie because their own experience is: "No, I'm not enough. I'm not a snowflake. I'm just average." There's both. And these challenges don't come with equal force to everyone, for sure. That's right. It's so, Daryl, if you are free from this sense of self-condemnation, that's a great blessing for you. And that's not to diminish it. That's fantastic. How can others learn from you how you have become free of that? And for others of us, that's a great challenge. It's, to be honest, it's not really, and I would agree with you, it's not really, it's not my greatest challenge. I have many other challenges. That's not particularly one of them. Mark. to death. Oh, yeah, the words of con yeah, that's right. Con condemning words lead us to death. I like that. Yeah, that's by very, almost very definition. So this takes us to our last point, which you'll be very glad. Um, the answer to all of this, the problem here that is a sense of separation from God. God isn't with us. But then the answer, of course, is, what's the answer ultimately to all of these things? Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That experience that Jill just described of in your doubt, in your condemnation, in your struggles, wherever you are, to actually experience God. And as many people testify, when God comes upon us like that, it's often with a sense of light and of heat, the warmth. Sometimes God does that so powerfully, um, and that is wonderful. But the healing that we need is knowing that God loves us. That's, it's really simple, but that's what we come back to all the time, that God loves us. And nothing can separate us from God's love, neither the opposition of people, nor our, uh, the sense that he won't come through for us, nor our own failures, nor the condemnation of others. If you were to memorize, if you were to say, how does this become real in my life? Here's your homework. If you want homework, why don't you try memorizing these three verses? Or if you can't memorize those three verses, just verse 39. Not, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You just make it personal. Nothing can separate you. Not your own stuff ups, not the condemnation of others, nothing. There's no better truth in all of reality for that. And, and we're at the end of our time. We were probably there a little while ago. 
But it makes so much sense psychologically. We all know the fundamental need of every human being is to be loved from birth. It's the whole presupposition of attachment theory of parenting. Every human being to flourish needs to be loved and we need to be loved. And there's no better news than that the perfect, infinite, all-powerful creator God loves you with an unstoppable love from which nothing can separate you or me. Like, yeah. That's good news. Karl Barth, the great one, arguably one of the greatest theologians of last century. He was also a polygamist, but let's not go there. He, he did have a long-term adulterous relationship with his secretary who he then got to move in to his home with his wife. It was a terrible inconsistency, just appalling uh, mistreatment of his wife. But be that it is May, this unbelievably brilliant theologian, he was asked at the, towards the end of his life by a, an interviewer, Dr. Bart, what's the greatest theological truth you know? And he said, the greatest truth I know, I learned on my mother's knee as a child, and it is this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. It's the greatest truth. Isn't that cool? Lord, may we know this greatest truth, that uh, you love us, and nothing can change that. And we are secure and safe in that. And no matter what else happens, and gosh, a whole lot of miserable, horrible stuff inside us and outside us and around us is happening and will happen. But in all of that, as Jill testified, you love us, you are with us, you are enough for us. And that is just so wonderful, Lord. And may that be our experience even this morning. Amen. We're going to respond by singing again. One last song of worship as we lift our praises to God. Jesus loves me.